Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Ms. Simo Vagasola giving his uh, third lecture. Uh, please uh, use the microphone when you are asking questions. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here. It's the last day of the week, so it's, uh, it's hard, I understand. Um, so just since it's the last day of the week, I initially I planned to go just on the board, but then I thought you, I better motivate you because it's going to be kind of a crash course on uh, uh, reinforcement learning. So just to give you a motivation, I, uh, I want to show you one example of RL in action. So this way, maybe you're going to be more motivated to follow the year, the, the hour and a half that it's going to follow, which is mostly going to be at the board. Uh, it will be fast, and uh, hopefully by the end of the, of the lecture, you will see, for example, what this scheme exactly means. So there's an agent, in this case, it's mouse, which is taking actions. Now you know by now that it's important to be active and to take actions. In response to these actions, uh, it takes some reward, it has some observations, and then it changes its own state and it proceeds this way. So this scheme of this is the scheme of reinforcement learning. We'll go through this uh, momentarily. And uh, let me show you what you can do by RL, by one example. This example is, uh, is the one that I've been working mostly on. So I picked this very biased. There's plenty of examples of uh, reinforcement learning. I picked the one that we used a, a few years ago, which is thermal soaring. Uh, thermal soaring is something that birds do. Let me show you what uh, a falcon uh, does. This is a falcon which is uh, flying over a plane. And then at a certain point, it starts, as you can see, to spiral. And while it's spiraling, uh, you cannot see this, but it's going up, it's gain height. So this is something that uh, birds uh, typically do. Not, they don't flap their wings, they use the ascending currents, so they save on energy. This is something that the migratory birds also use a lot because this way they can save energy and they can go much, much farther because they don't have the ballast of the fat that they should carry otherwise. And by using this, they gain height without flapping wings. In the case of the predatory birds like the falcon, this is useful because they have a, a vantage point, a viewpoint, and then they can go, they can predate much better. In the case of the migratory birds, uh, they, do, they do this because they save energy on the migratory routes. Yes, David. So when, they, when they're going up, um, when they're going up, do they spiral with a fixed chirality? They, 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 once they, once they start spiraling in one direction, they tend, as you can see, also this is a drawing of Leonardo, which makes Leonardo da Vinci was observing the birds from the uh, Vatican Gardens. As you can see, once they start spiraling in one direction, they tend to spiral in the same direction. As far as I know, there's no chiral, so they can spiral in both directions. But usually, they maintain the 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 the, the spiraling when they start spiraling. Up. Yes. Um, so this I said, and uh, in addition to understanding, it's, clear, it's clearly a behavioral and neurobiological problem because you would like to understand what's going on in the brain and how they can manage to do this. Uh, there's also a technological uh, importance and application because you can use this for gliders. Gliders, they do surveillance, they do delivery, they do monitoring, and of course, there's also drones and military applications, not my favorite ones, but they exist. And um, what's the point? The point is that these gliders, uh, um, the engine of these gliders, you cannot put a big, uh, a big engine like on a plane. Uh, usually they have batteries. The batteries are limited and therefore the autonomy of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of these gliders, it's limited. Therefore, if you can manage to save energy by doing the process, the same process that the birds are doing, which is soaring, and then gliding, and then soaring again. All this doesn't cost any energy because you're using these ascending currents, and therefore you can extend the autonomy of the, of the gliders by big amounts. As you will see, we managed to get the, the, the gliders uh, aloft four times that can be one hour, two hours, three hours at group locations. Um, so how do you go with this? Well, this is uh, hopefully by the end of the, of the lecture, these scribbles and these uh, hieroglyphs so far, they will become clear. This is the Q function that I was mentioning the other, the other time, is the quality function. 
uh, is getting updated by this, by this rule, which is called temporal difference. I will explain what it is by the end of this lecture. Here, I would like you to pay attention to what, by the end of this whole procedure, uh, which is reinforcement learning, you manage to do. At the very beginning of the training, you have the glider, which is, in this case, it's a simulation. So it's an agent, it's a, it's a computational agent. It starts up there at 400 meters and it sinks like a stone because it, it take, it's taking random actions. So it goes down because you sink, there's gravity and you sink. By the end of the training, which is a few uh, hundreds episodes, uh, this is what it does. So it, it, it flies like this, and then it picks an ascending current and it starts to spiral up and it reaches, uh, it gains a few hundred meters in, a, in a, the corresponding of a few minutes. These are numerical simulations that we started first. You can do the same thing in the field, uh, which we did later. This is a glider that you see up there. And as you can see, it's flying at the height of the, of the wings. It doesn't have any engine. The only thing it does is that it's using these ascending currents. It has learned how to use these ascending currents. So it's able to stay up and reach the height of the clouds without, without any, any engine. And if you wanna see what it looks like, this is the glider. It's a two meter wingspan uh, glider that you can buy for a few hundred dollars. Uh, the plot on the right is the height as a function of time. And this is the trajectory that the, uh, that the, 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 aid, the glider is, is, is flying. As you can see, it's again spiral. And the idea of the spiral is very clear. You have an ascending current, which you shouldn't imagine like an elevator because it's turbulent, it's full of fluctuations. And that's the difficulty of, of flying into such, a, such an object. But you can imagine something going this way. So what you want to do by this spiral is that you want to stay close to the core where you have the maximum of ascension and the push in the, in the, in the, in the vertical direction. Um, of course, you all know uh, the fluid are incompressible in the atmosphere. So having an updraft, it means that you have a downdraft. So you can, you can imagine the difficulty if by chance you pick a downdraft then you're gonna go down. And indeed there are cases with the paragliders where you fly close to a cliff and you pick the descending, the down draft and you get smashed onto the cliff. This has happened several times. So you can, it's a dangerous game to play but it's a very useful one if you wanna save energy. Okay. And this is the- uh, Another question, please. Yes. Uh, is, it, is it always best to do the tightest possible spiral? No, not at all, no. No, because by doing the tighter spiral, what you do is that you pick uh, you pick a lot on the fluctuations. So you, you wanna have a, a radius of the spiral, which is uh, comparable to the, to the size of the, of the vortex, of the ascending current. A little bit like yesterday in the talk that you saw in the afternoon, there's a radius of the, of the, of the ascending current of this uh, updraft. And therefore you wanna be inside but not, not at the center, also because there would be a problem with inertia in spiraling too close. That would take too much mm -hmm. of inertia, that yes. would be too much banking. Therefore, it would be unstable for flight. So you settle for something which is of the order of the radius of the, of the typical updrafts. So both the pitch and the radius are learned yes. given the turbulent yes. environment. Well, they're learned as a function in response to mechanical cues that the, uh, that the agent is getting. For example, the acceleration, the vertical acceleration, it responds to this vertical acceleration and it, it spirals. So we don't tell the glider to make spirals. We give the gliders the mechanical cues, which is the acceleration. And then the glider figures out with this acceleration that it should be making these spirals. And it, and it too chooses randomly left and right-handed spirals? Yes, uh, at least at the beginning here, it's, it chooses and then as you can see, it keeps, it's irregular. It's not Leonardo drawing. So it's quite irregular, but yes, it tends to spiral as you can see. Thank you. And these are the trajectories that one typical trajectory that you can see here, there's many more. Um, and, um, and you can also use this in, in other uh, situations. For example, this is more recent work that we did in order to explain the phenomenon that you've probably seen of dogs that tend to uh, uh, follow trails and they alternate between smelling on the ground and up in the air. Sometimes you see the dogs that are raising on their hind legs 
and they smell up in the air. So we, we were intrigued by this observation. It's something that I've seen so many times that I wanted to figure out if there's a rationale into this. And uh, there seems to be one, which is uh, very simple. The simple idea is that on the ground, of course, the, the, flow, uh, the, the flow is slower because you're close to the ground and there's a boundary layer. And uh, it sticks to the ground, so the signal on the ground is more regular and easier to track because it's more persistent. But of course, the, the signal doesn't go that far because, because the velocity at the, at the boundary layer is smaller. Up in the air, the signal is much more turbulent. It's much more intermittent. It's harder to track, but it goes much farther, farther down. Therefore, what the animal does is that it tends to smell on the ground because that's the way it can move much faster. But in case it loses signal for too long, then it's a rescue. Uh, it's a rescue strategy that it gets on the on the on the hind leg. They smell up. It pays a cost. The cost is that, of course, it has to stop or slow down because smelling in the air, you move slower. But it's a cost which is good to pay because this way you you get some signal and you know where you should be heading. In other words, this is a this is an SOS signal that the animal is using when it's losing signal, and then it thinks that it's very far away from the source. And so, by using RL, we managed to show that in a in a channel flow and in a turbulent flow, there's a, the, there's alternation between uh, between smelling on the ground and smelling up in the air, and we can rationalize and give some some rules and some understanding as to why this is getting out. Okay, so these are the people who are with whom I've been doing this uh, this works, and um, I think I can uh, done with this, and I can start going to the board. So hopefully by now uh, you uh, you see what uh, RL can do. It's no magic. Uh, so what I would like to to do is to explain uh, how this uh, this uh, learning goes and um let me start with the scheme that you've seen before so you have an agent which could be the glider in the previous case uh, there's an environment with which it is interacting in this case is the is the atmosphere is the atmospheric uh, 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 environment it, it makes actions Taking actions in the case of the gliders means, for example, that you change the bank angle or you change the pitch or you can change any of the parameters of the, uh, of the, of the gliders. Of course, you cannot change the environment by itself because that's what it is. But you can go by using some cues, you can go to locations that you estimate to be better or worse. Okay? So what you can do is to change your, your own parameters of flight. And you do this in response to percepts Percept can be rewards. So in the case of the gliders, for example, if you get the kick up, the glider pilots, they say that they, they, they pilot with their butts because what they do is that they sense when they get an acceleration up. So vertical acceleration is a reward that you, that, that you get. And observations. Observations in the case of the gliders, is, for example, one thing that we haven't used in this particular application, but could be used and should be used in order to improve further, is the presence of some clouds. Little clouds, that white clouds, they signal the fact that there's humidity, there's air which is going up, hot, hotter air is going up, and then it's releasing humidity. It's the formation of the rain that was discussed yesterday afternoon. So even without forming uh, rain, you form clouds because you release humidity and therefore you form clouds. So the presence of some little white clouds, well dense and well compact, it's a signature of the presence of, 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 uh, um, of updrafts. And therefore it's something, it's an observation that you could be using in order to, uh, to, to decide what to do. What's the goal? The goal typically is to maximize cumulative reward. Now, the reward function is not fixed. The reward function is, uh, which is called the value. So cumulative reward 
the distinction between the instantaneous reward and the cumulative reward, the cumulative reward is called value. And <clears throat> by now it's clear that the way you should be doing this is by continuous interaction. So at relatively fast uh, frequency, you have to make decisions, sample the system and keep going this. So it's not something that you do passively, it's something that you want to do continuously or with the frequency which is high enough. In the case of the gliders, the typical time scale is of the order of one second. So every second, we, we make a decision and we decide what to do, which is also the typical time of the glider pilots. Okay. <clears throat> so what's the formulation? S is the state of the system. State of the system, it's the state of the glider and the state of the, of the environment. A are actions. And um, <clears throat> what is known, uh, what is known uh, are the transition probabilities. So the probability that, uh, so this is the transition probability. And there's a reward function, which is given in the problem. So this is an average, we all, I'll always be looking at the, at the average reward. Okay. So these functions are given. They might be unknown. They might be, uh, 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 the reward is, is, uh, is, is giving you uh, the, the, well, the reward. And this is the probability that if you take an action A and you are in a state S, you're gonna transition, at least you're gonna try to transition to state uh, S prime. So the scheme is that your S, you take an action A and you go to S prime, or you tend to go to S prime, okay? What's the cumulative reward? It's coming, it's coming. Markoviani, it's coming. Yes, I'll comment on this in a second. So what's cumulative reward? I'll comment on this. It's not that it's not important. It's just that it's so important that it deserves to be commented a bit longer. So cumulative reward, what is it? It's that you, you consider to uh, capital T or to infinity uh, R S of T, A of T, S of T plus one. So this is the discounted case. And the finite horizon case, as we did previously, is the sum of this. Okay, and what's the goal of all this? The goal of all this is to find, is to identify a policy of actions. What I like in reinforcement learning is that it makes it clear that you want to learn, you want to get some information, you want to learn something, but at the end of the day, what you want to do is that you want to control your system, you want to take actions. So the idea is that you want to identify a policy of actions, phi of A given S. For example, in the case of the glider, it's telling you, I know what the environment around me looks like, I know my bank angle, my pitch, how should I change my bank angle and my pitch in response to this state of myself and the environment? So the action could be, for example, increase your bank angle, reduce your bank angle, and so on. And the uh, 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 optimal policy is the optimal policy pi star. Is the one that maximizes the expected reward. of, for example, in the case of the discounted reward, what I just said. Okay. Okay, so as, uh, as it was already noticed, uh, this formulation uh, is Markovian. This formulation is Markovian. When you, when, you got, when you got at this stage, this formulation is Markovian because at the next time step, you're not gonna remember the previous reward. 
you're not going to remember the state s of t minus 10. You just remember and you just decide on the basis of s of t, you're going to transition to s of t plus 1. Okay? Now, as I was telling in the first lecture, uh, formulating the problem this way doesn't mean that you don't have memory. Because, in fact, the memory could be stored in the states. Okay? For example, I could remember the previous uh, he said I could be storing I could store in principle I could store the entire trace of my detections for example of the acceleration I just store as uh, as an integral for example with the kernel of k of t minus tau a of tau I store this and therefore I can remember what was the acceleration 10 seconds ago and I store this into my states and I update them okay so the fact that we write the equations this way doesn't mean that there's no memory. It just means that you have to properly uh, define the state space in order to have memory of the past detections. But once the states are properly defined, then the formulation of the problem is Markovian, as you see. Okay. Lambda is the discount. Uh, it's the it's the discount uh, discounted rate. As I was uh, saying before, this is a parameter that goes between zero and one, and uh, defines the horizon. So the typical horizon is this. So in the case of the gliders, for example, the typical time scale is of the order of a few minutes, and therefore what you do is that you pick your lambda in such a way that the horizon is of the order of a few minutes. Okay, so that's the that's the idea. <clears throat> yes. Sit again. Sure. I mean, memory always helps because possibly you can forget. So if you include more memory, it certainly helps a priori. But what it means, the price though is that the state, the, the dimension of the state space is gonna go up. As the state space is gonna go up, this means that it's gonna be harder to learn and you're gonna need more episodes in order to learn properly, okay? So you have to make a compromise. A priori, it always helps because possibly you forget. You don't take into account, for example, all these higher moments of the, of the signal. You just ignore them. The problem is that you, you have to learn that you should ignore them. And therefore, you're going to need more data. So there's a compromise that you have to strike. When you go in practice, then uh, 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 the state space should not be too big. What we did over there with the gliders, we started with a, a deep neural net. We scaled down to your neural net, and we ended up with the lookup table. The reason is that this way, with a few hundred episodes in the, in the, in the, in the desert, we could learn how to fly. If you train a neural net or a deep neural net, it's going to take million or billion of uh, several millions of episodes, which would have taken, uh, we would still be there in the desert flying, uh, flying gliders. Okay. So there's a compromise. Yes. Some maneuvers that you can just. Correct. Increase five degrees, decrease five degrees the bank angle or stay with the same bank angle. And the acceleration was discretized high acceleration, positive, high ac acceleration, negative, or almost no acceleration. And the other signal that was sensed was the torque. So whether the velocity on the right wing minus the velocity on the left wing, the vertical velocity, was high or low, positive or negative. So these two signals, we discretized three values for each. So it was nine values, three times three. And the possible moves were five or six, I don't remember, or seven, I don't remember exactly, uh, moves on the bank angle. This was the look. Questions? Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, very good. So now, uh, reward observation. So what is the, what is the value function? So value function of a state. For a policy pi. Well, the value function 
but v of pi of the state s is the following thing is the expected value because uh, this is a random uh, you can make you have the probabilities of transitioning over there so you you take the average with respect to this the reward is already averaged but the process of choices and i take the discounted case just for simplicity you can take the finite horizon case uh, in the case in the case of the finite horizon case that maybe there's one remark that I should make at this stage. Um, the finite horizon case it's a little bit uh, simpler to get you know you don't have to worry about this extra parameter here, but there's a catch with the finite horizon case, which is the following I told you i'm looking for a policy here and I didn't write any time. I didn't write any time because in, in general, this should be a function of time. This should be uh, because if you approach the, uh, the the end of the horizon, of course, you have to become more greedy. You don't care anymore about learning about the system. You become more and more greedy. Okay. So in general, this policy here in the finite horizon case should be a function of t. In the discounted case, as you see from this form here, this is uh, this is time invariant. It's an exponential. It's essentially an exponential because lambda of t is the exponential of t and you know that the exponential is the uh, are the eigenvectors of uh, translation of uh, of translation and therefore if you move one step farther this doesn't change and therefore i can be looking at the policy which is stationary and time invariant so that's the advantage of the discounted case that you can look for a stationary policy rather than a policy that changes with time as you approach the horizon that's why I'm I'm taking that case because this way I don't need to put t at each and every step. Okay. Good. So um, lambda t and the s of t, a of t, s of t plus one, conditional to s of zero being s. Okay. So this is the value, and notice that this is cumulative. So I'm summing over over the whole process and when lambda is not close to zero i'm really summing over many episodes therefore i should be worrying what my action a of uh, a of uh, uh, t uh, for example at the initial action how is this is going to impact my future and that's the whole difficulty of the problem now here we come to the q function so the state value function which is also called quality function that's that's where the q is coming from and this is a function of uh, state and action and it's the expected value of the same thing exactly the same thing the cumulative reward but now i condition to two things to the initial state being s and the initial action being a of course, this one gives me more information because it gives me uh, both the this. So v the, the the value function can be obtained from this one by taking the uh, the by taking the argmax of this and plugging into into here. And the optimal values. V star or Q star. Um, are for the optimal policy pi equal to pi step. So these are the holy grades. If you manage to if you manage to calculate uh, uh, v star or q star, then you're done because at each time step you know what to do. What you have to do is if you have q star, you read from this here. I'm in a state S. I look at the possible actions that I can take. I calculate the various Q. I know the various Q. And of course, I pick the art max. So I pick the action which is giving me the highest quality function. Same thing with V. In that case, I pick the action from here. So it's another art max that I, that I can use. Good. OK. So now can I ask a, another sure, question? Of um, are there uh, problems which have a kind of spin glass character where 
the landscape is very frustrated and you get trapped. I coming with to that. This problem has a property of contractility. So the iterations that I will be uh, showing you in a second of the Q function, for example, and so on, they have a contractility problem. So in principle, you can show that you're gonna go down to the solution. Mm -hmm. That's something that I will show. It's the Bellman uh, equation. I will show you in a second. Thanks. Uh, before I get there, it's right the next step. I wanna show you, I wanna give you an idea because there's so many papers and there's so many applications and there's so many things that are getting done that I would like to give you a little bit of the general sense about this problem. So there are different ways, there are different problems. Model knowledge. Okay. So what do I mean by this? I mean the following. Um, let's make an example. Let's make an example of the uh, grid wall. So the grid wall is simply a grid. And uh, here there's some loss, here there's some reward, here there's some places where I cannot go because for example, just imagine a cleaning robot which is going through, through a room and it's cleaning, it cannot go at some location. Here it's sucking something which is uh, hurting the cleaning process. Here there's some rubbish. So this is, this is good because it's getting a reward. Okay, so now what is S? S is the location. And uh, P of actions, you can go north, you can go west, you can go east, you can go south, or you can stand still. That's pretty clear. Uh, now, what is uh, P of S prime, even S and A? Um, this is what the robot would like to do. So the robot can give the input that being in a certain state, I'm gonna take an action N, W, E, or S. So it would like to move north, for example, if it chooses N. Now, why there's a probability and it's not a delta function, because in general, what could happen, for example, is that the robot sends the signal to go north, but for example, there can be a slippage or there can be a, 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 an obstacle like this, and therefore it cannot go north. Okay? So that's why there's a probability and it ends up, for example, if it hurts this way, it could go this way or it could go this way. That's why there's a probability P of S prime of S and A. Now, what do I mean by knowledge of the environment and knowledge of the state? So there's one case where, like this one, I know everything. So I know my state because my GPS, for example, on the robot is very effective, it's very efficient. And therefore, I know exactly at the grid location, the grid location where I am. This means that I know exactly my state. And I know exactly the model of the environment because I'm building up all this, all this map here. Now, there's situations where you don't know your state, imagine just, for example, that the GPS is not perfectly right, okay? It gives you with some resolution and the resolution of the GPS is not comparable to the grid side. Though, therefore, what you do know is that you are in a certain area, which is here, and therefore the state is only partially known. You have some observations, but you don't know exactly your state. Similarly, you can know the model of the environment perfectly right, for example, in chess, you're playing chess, you have the position of all the uh, pieces on the, on the, on the, uh, and out of this, you know what the rules are and there's no problem, the model is exactly known. In other situations, like you, you don't know exactly the model of the environment and therefore this is a knowledge that, that is absent. Now, sorry, can I ask another yeah, question? Sure. Absolutely. Um, are there situations where it pays to have an adaptive grid um, given sure. a, Yes, you can, you can, depending on the resolution and the things you can refine your grid. This is, a, this is the typical simple example which is given, but if you really want to do the, if you really want to do the, the robot and you clean a, the cleaning robot, then yes, you have to be a little bit more smarter than this. You have to make adaptive, you have to make several. Uh, 
Um, good. So, um, depending on on how much you know of the model and how much of the environment, how much you know of the state, there are different situations that you you have to tackle. The situation where you know everything, like the gridlock, is the case of Markov decision processes, which we'll tackle in a second. Markov decision processes. And as you will see in this case, since you know the state and you know the model, you know exactly what is going to happen. This reduces to a computational problem, which is called Bellman equation. So Bellman uh, equation, I'll write it down in a second, gives you the solution. In principle, the problem is solved. The only issue with, uh, in this case, is that this, the, the, the dimension of the state space could be so huge that you cannot manage to store it, and therefore it becomes intractable from a computational point of view. But a priori, the problem is reduced to a Bellman equation that you can solve. The case where you don't know the state, like for example, in this case where the GPS is, uh, has reduced um, resolution, you go into the problem which is called partially observable Markov decision processes. And the name comes from the fact that you uh, partially observe the state you get some cues, you can know, for example, more or less where you are, but the state, the exact state is unknown. So you only have observation out of which you have to make inferences of, of the state. Okay, so then we move, again, this can be reduced to a, 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 a Bellman equation. It's a functional Bellman equation, so it gets even more complicated because it becomes to be, uh, it starts to be a functional, but a priori can be solved. This is the case of the bandits, for example. This is the case of the olfactory searches. So this is this is an interesting case. Now, the case of the of the of the atmosphere is the case we start to move into here. So we don't know the model. The model of the atmosphere, a priori, if you were uh, able to solve all the equations of the atmosphere, you would be able to know what the atmosphere is going to do. But you don't want to do this because it's too complicated and it's too, uh, there's too, uncertain, too much uncertainty. So what we've done over there is that we learn from the data. We learn from the experience. That's what reinforcement learning does. Typically, it doesn't take a model. It's not a model. It's not a control problem. Typically, what RL does in this space here, we are more in the space of control. Here, we are moving into the empirical and data-driven uh, actions. And therefore, what you do here is that you, you start to do uh, things like temporal difference, Q-learning, and so on. Um, TD is temporal difference, Q-learning and SARSA are the techniques that we've been using in order, for example, to train the gliders. And down here, it's open. Nobody knows exactly what to do. It's probably where our brain is functioning. So uh, this, is, this is open. You know, if I wanted to show off my Latin, I would say that this is unknown and uncharted territory. And here, uh, it's unknown. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's happening. And it's something that people are currently a lot working on. People are working here and working here on this on this set. OK, so um, let me show you the Bellman equation, if there's no question. It's OK. It's clear the scheme. You, you see how these different things well, by, by the end, you should be able to have an idea about this tree. So let me start with the Bellman. Um, what is Bellman, Bellman saying? Bellman makes a very simple but useful observation. So what Bellman says, 
and remarks is the following thing that I have to calculate this object here. Okay, Look, let me break it up. It's a little bit, it always reminds me of the Dyson equation, but uh, it's my it's my own it's my own bias. Uh, S1, A1, uh, S2, and so on. So now what it does is that it, it break it takes all this in the future here. And what it says is that if the policy uh, the policy pi is optimal, then irrespective of what I'm doing here, what follows should be optimal, okay? And how it's using this, it's using this in the following way. So this is also equal to the sum over S prime of P of S prime A. And I break this into the immediate reward that I get at this step, plus the future. And here it's important that you see this, this uh, uh, lambda t, because in this form, it's easier to write down. Otherwise, you have to do a little bit more work. So this t now goes from 1 to infinity. And I have lambda of t plus minus 1 r s of t, a of t, s of t plus 1, conditional to s1 being s prime. Here it's useful to have the discounted case because you see what is happening. Then now this here is the value function, is the value function of S prime. So what you get is that this is equal to the sum over of the reward. This is the immediate reward plus lambda. This is now if I want the maximum, the, the, the best policy, then the best policy what I have to do is that I have to take the maximum of this. So by V star, it's going to be the maximum over all possible policies pi of this object here, which is sum over S prime. S A of the reward, S prime A S plus lambda V of V star of S prime. And this is the Bellman equation. So what, what's the nature of this equation? It's a nonlinear equation because of course there's a maximum here. Therefore, it's nonlinear. It appears linearly, but there's a max which is over there. So it's a nonlinear equation for a function v that lives on the state space. So coming back to your question before, of course, the larger is the state space, the more complicated it's going to be to solve this equation because it lives in a higher and higher dimension. Um, if you know v star then you know what the action is going to be because you're going to take, uh, you're going to take the, uh, arg, uh, the arc max of this here, and therefore you're going to know what the action and what the policy should be. No, this is V star of S prime. Yeah, yes. So this is V star of S. And there's a similar equation for uh, the quality function, which is the following one. A of S and A, I don't remember whether I said P A A S or S A, sum over S prime of P
So this is the star. This is the Bellman equation for the quality function. Okay, so now um, this this kind of equa this equation is also called Hamilton Jacobi Bellman because it was realized by Kalman a uh, few years later after uh, Bellman that in fact this equation is related to the cal calculus of variations is related to the Hamilton Jacobi equation and the uh, uh, extremal uh, principles. So I won't, uh, I won't do this, this because it would take uh, too long, but let me give you a few references on this where you can read more. There's the book of Bellman himself, which is called Dynamic Programming. Uh, there's the book. In fact, it's more than a book, it's two volumes uh, of Bertsekas, which is called Dynamic Programming and Optimal Control. And then um, I have it here. Uh, no, uh, the reference of uh, Kalman. I don't have here, I can provide it if you want. Oh, it's a paper of Kalman in 63. Uh, it's something like uh, calculus of variations, uh, something uh, of that type. Uh, I can provide the reference, sorry, I didn't write it up. Uh, okay, so how do you solve this Bellman equation? Because it's a big uh, equation, looks like uh, intimidating, in fact, this equation uh, has a very nice uh, property, which is a property of contractility and contraction. As a, a, uh, the following property. So, as you were saying, as you noticed before, this is a, a self-consistent equation. So it's an equation that tells me that V star on this side should be equal to a, an operator applied to V star itself, okay? This is a constant, this applies to this. So there's, a, there's an operator, the scheme, the structure of this equation here is that V star, is equal to a Bellman operator acting on V star itself, okay? So let's, of course, this is a big dimensional space. V lives in a big, big high dimensional space, but let's look for a second at a similar problem in one dimension and you'll get the idea and then I'll tell you what happens in more than one dimension. So let's suppose that you have to solve the problem X equal to F of X. So now x is a single uh, variable and x lives in R. So what I have to do is that I, uh, this is y equal x. And then I have a function here, which is my uh, f of x. And this of course is x star. Just read it here. So now let's do the simplest, most stupid thing that I can do, which is I start from X naught, okay? And so what I do is that now I move here. This is gonna give me this. So I make an iterative scheme, X naught is, uh, uh, I take X, the next iteration is going to be this. The next iteration is going to be uh, Xn, equal to f of xn minus one. So graphically, this is what I'm doing. I'm getting here, this will be my x1. This x1 is gonna go here, this will be my x2 and so on. And I move toward the fixed point. And if I go this other way, it's going to be the same thing and I'm gonna approach my fixed point. So 
Why is this working? Because in general, if I take any function, this scheme is not going to work. So what's so special in this drawing, in this function which I've drawn, which is making that the, uh, uh, the, all this iterative scheme very simple converges? Yes. No, it's not just that it's concave. Because if I do it like this, it's not going to work. No, it's not a single fixed point. It could converge to different fixed point depending on where you start. Absolutely. <laughs> so in general, it doesn't work. Be guaranteed it doesn't work. It doesn't work in general. But this drawing, this drawing is special. This drawing is special, and it's special because the derivative is less than one. That's the trick. The trick is that this curve is, 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 has a derivative which is everywhere less than one. And the curve such that the derivative is always less than one, it's what again was discussed yesterday afternoon, the divergence of, a fun of the velocity is telling you how much you contract or you dilate the volume. So this means that you're contracting your volumes and therefore you start somewhere and you contract. So this is a property of contractivity. So contractility in general, what it means is that if you are in a norm space, you might remember that complete space with norms are called Banach spaces. And uh, with the norm, this contractility means that you're uh, less or equal than gamma with gamma less than one, a positive and less than one. So this is what this is what contractility means, and um, this operator here has a contractility problem. So the way this equation is solved is that you start with v zero, you go into v one, which is bana v zero. This goes into v two, which is ban uh, Bellman operator v one and so on. And I won't give you the proof that this is uh, has a contractility property, but just to give you a sense as to why this, uh, this happens, let's look at the structure of this, uh, of this equation here. Okay. So what I want to do, uh, I forget to mention that uh, if you have a contractility property, then it's a theorem shown by Banach himself, is that if you have a contractility property, then the property that you, that you said, which is there's a single fixed point, comes for free. So if the operator is contracting, then there's necessarily there's a single fixed point. Okay. So that, that comes as a result of the, of the property of this operator. There's a single fixed point and you reach this fixed point by, by just iterative schemes. So in our case, why there's, a, there's this property? I won't, as I said, I won't do the full mathematics because it would take too long. But what I want to do is that take the infinite norm, the L infinite norm, which means the soup over, of B over all possible uh, values. Then I have, this will be equal. I'm just reading from here. Okay, this term is a constant. So the only difference if I take two different V uh, functions is that in, the, in this term here. So this will be lambda sum of S prime of P of S prime, uh, S A of V one of S prime minus V two of S prime. Uh, this okay, perfect. So now this one here, you're summing over all possible S prime, and you remember that the norm, the sum of the norms is less or equal than the norm of the sum. So this will be uh, less or equal than lambda sum of S prime 
of PS prime S of A. And so this will be less or equal than the norm of V1 minus V2 infinity. And now the other thing is that the sum over all possible states, this is a transition probability, therefore this is equal to one. So this is lambda V1 minus V2 infinity. And lambda, you remember, is the discount factor. Lambda is less than one. Therefore, the operator is contracting, and therefore, by iterative scheme, you're gonna you're gonna convert. Okay. That's the trick. So this essentially solves the problem, and that's what Bellman and uh, later on other people did. This is the control. It's Bellman. Everything is well controlled. Of course, there's a big problem, which is the in practice the curse of dimensionality. For example, if you apply this to chess, you know that eventually you're going to con con converge, but eventually means longer than the time of the universe because you have to consider that the state space here is the states of all possible moves given all possible positions of the pieces on the checkboard. So just go and count and you, you realize, yes. Can you can you speak up, please? Does it mean that in some sense this operator has one eigenvalue which is zero and other eigenvalues are negative in some sense? So that, uh... Yes, probably, probably something like this. Uh, if I have, I've never thought in terms of eigenvalues because of the contractivity, but uh, maybe yes, we can think about this. Let me, I don't have the answer right now, but probably yes. Um, so in practice, if you have a Markov decision process where you know the reward, you know the transition, you know everything, what, uh, what you have to do is to solve the Bellman equation. And solving the Bellman equation, you, can, you, have for, you, you, you must, in practice, often parameterize the state space. So this is where, for example, deep neural net, functional approximation, features, uh, selection, they come in, how to parameterize this state space here. But once this is done and it's reduced to a, a something affordable and computationally affordable, then you just turn the crank, you iterate the Bellman equation and you get to a solution uh, and you stop when uh, V of N plus one, of course, minus B of V of N is uh, below epsilon, then you stop. So you make an iterative scheme and you stop at the given precision. Okay, good. So now, questions? This property is extremely important because it will, it, it, it's it, it, the fact that you're converging and there's a fixed point, uh, the a single one and there's a contractility property is what justifies all this iterative scheme. The first time you look at what they're doing by this iteration, you say, there's no way this is going to converge, but underlying this, there's this property here. So the Bellman equation is really capital. You don't use it, but below everything you learning and all the other things, there's the Bellman equation and the contractivity property and the iterative schemes, they converge because of this. Okay? Just keep in mind this property is really important. That's why even though it's mathematics, I spend a little bit. Questions? Yes. Well, you, you can formulate the problem that way. Usually you don't have a an initial and a final state. Usually you have an initial state and you move on from there. You can formulate the problem as an initial state and the final state. In that case, you can also formulate the Bellman equation the same way. And because usually what you do is that you, you, solve, you solve backward and you solve the problem. So if you have a final state, you're starting from a final condition, which is given. So you can do it. But typically you don't have a final state. You have an initial state and you move on. But you can do it. You can certainly do it. Then you have two boundary conditions. In fact, in the Bellman equation is also used in economy. And in that case, there's a cost at the end. So the problem in economy is formulated, as you just said, there's a final cost and therefore there's an there's a, a initial condition, there's a final condition. Questions? 
questions? Okay, so um, what happens now if you don't know the state? So going back to the scheme that I was drawing before, you don't know the state. For example, in the grid world, the resolution is not sufficient. Another example of a case, can I erase that one? Another example is the bandits that we were discussing the other day. So let's look at the bandits and figure out what the POMDP is. So let's look at the bandits. Uh, now we are in the POMDPs, so partially observable decision processes. Um, so let's figure out what the bandits are. So the state of the environment is mu A and mu B. So this is what my environment is. These are the probability of reward of my two arms, okay? Um, and in fact, the transition probability, it's very simple. No matter what the action is, these two values don't change, okay? And the reward is very simple. This is a function just of S and A, and it's mu of the action that I take. Okay. So the action is choosing A or B. Now, here you don't even need to solve the Bellman equation. You know what, if you knew the state of the environment, you know what you should be doing. Maximize reward, you should be playing the argmax of R, and you should pick the one that gives you the highest uh, mu. So the problem here is that you don't know the environment, right? Mu A and mu B are not known. And why it's called partially observable? Because in fact, what, as we've discussed uh, before, um, what you do know are the posterior probabilities at time t, after you play the certain number of times, you have estimates of this. Factorized like this. And we know what this object are because we already wrote them. So And then this, the noise function. Okay. Uh, in the case of the SPRT, in this case, the actions are uh, stop. And then it could choose hypothesis one or hypothesis two or continue the observations. And the state space. It's again made by two hypotheses, H1 and H2, which don't change, which don't change over time. So the transition probability is simple. The problem is that I don't know my, my, my state. I don't know my environment. I don't know my state. Otherwise, the problem would be completely trivial and obvious eh, because I would know what hypothesis is or I would know what's the best R. Okay. So that's why it's partially observable because as you see here, I don't quite know what the state is, but I have observations that allow me to make an inference on what the state could be. And in this literature, the posteriors are called beliefs. So I have beliefs on what my states are going to be, and I'm using the beliefs in order to drive my actions based on these beliefs. So what is a POMDP? In, in, uh, in practice. Is that clear? Yes? Clear what it is? Good. Okay. So now, what is a POMDP? How do I formulate the POMDP, the Bellman equation for POMDPs? Mm -hmm. 
It's very similar to the previous Bellman equation, except that uh, I'm now living in the space of beliefs and not value function or Q function. So I have P of S prime given a S. I have a my reward function, which is this. Now, what is new, and that's the new aspect of POMDP with respect to uh, MDP, is that I have I have a model for observations. So the observations are why. Um, and I have beliefs. P of S. So now the posterior probability, which is over there, in general is going to be a probability distribution over the state, the state space. I have some probabilities of what my state could be. And therefore, since I don't know the state, what the policy is going to be, well, the policy, since the states are not there, I only have beliefs on what the states are. The policy in this case, the holy grail, is going to be what action I should be taking if my beliefs are something. So you see, I'm going from a discrete space, possibly very big, but the discrete space of states, I'm going on to a, a, a continuous space of probability distributions. These are called beliefs. Other than that, of course, you can discretize. You can make a histogram, and then you reduce the beliefs to, the, to discrete, and then you go back to, to the previous one. But the new thing is that you have to update these beliefs here. Okay, so the beliefs, the state space in a sense of the argument here is updated. Uh, and the way it's updated is very simple. Um, A and Y, Y are, as I said, the observation. In the case of the bandits, the observation is whether I win or I lose. Okay? I'm playing, I win or I lose. In the case of the olfactory searches, the observation is whether I detect a molecule or I don't detect a molecule or I stumble upon the source. These are the observations. Based on the observation I and the actions that I took, I update my state and I make an update on my beliefs at new time step. So what the new beliefs is going to be? Well, this is Bayesian update. So I only do this. This is the probability, the likelihood that I make a certain observation given A and S prime. And I sum on the probability of going on to S prime, which is this. So this is the probability that given my prior beliefs on the states, I transition taking action A, I transition to S prime. And this is the probability that taking the action and S prime, I make the observation one. And this is divided by the sum over all, this is S prime, um, over all possible S prime of F times S P. So this is just the normalization factor. Okay. Uh, once I have this, then POMDP Bellman equation is, is just an equation, is the same as before, except that it's in the space of beliefs. So this will be the max over A of the sum. Now there's an extra sum over Y of uh, P of S So this is the transition. And then I have my usual structure, which is this one, plus lambda V star of P uh, S prime A. 
y, where e prime is defined by this. Okay. So the same as before, except that I live in this functional space of probability of beliefs. But the property is the same, in particular, the contractility is the, pro is the same because this is a transition probability again, it sums to one. This one, it's a V star on a space, it's still complete, Banach still applies, therefore it's still contracting. But of course it can take forever. I mean, the fact that a priori you can converge doesn't mean that you converge in a reasonable time. So when this space becomes big, it's complicated. And that's the reason why there's a few, very, very few solvable cases. One case is the bandits. And the reason why the bandits can be solved is very simple. You notice that um, at the next time step, the probability distribution can change if I play once this probability distribution. This can change. This can change. Certainly one of the two must change. But you remain in the same functional form. So it's still a, uh, uh, it, for, Bernoulli, uh, for the Bernoulli case of the bandits, the probability distribution keeps the same shape. It's still a beta function. And therefore, I'm just updating two parameters. So the problem, in fact, goes from being a, an entire probability distribution to the update of the two parameters that characterize my probability distribution. And therefore, it becomes solvable. In general, it's an entire probability distribution. One other case where it can be solved, it's the Gaussian case. Because in, if the process is Gaussian, then you have few parameters, the mean and the variance. And therefore, it's, it's simple to update. And this, you can show that solving this is like doing the Kalman filter. So the Kalman filter, it's optimal. It can be shown from this. I mean, it was done by Kalman independently of this, but it can be shown via this to be optimal. Okay. In general, what you have to do is that, uh, again, you have to parameterize this probability distribution in some way. You have to make approximations and you try to converge on the approximate shape of the probability distribution. Questions? Is it just because it has only two parameter or there's some other properties? Because I can think of some other probability distribution with. I mean, the most important one is that it's it's Gaussian and it stays Gaussian. So any stable distribution will hold or? Say it again. Any, it will hold for any stable distributions like Levy or something like. So what is important is the fact that you, um, that you conjugate. The process is conjugate, which means that the next time step, the probability distribution when you update it is going to stay the same. And the Gaussian has this property. The beta distribution, which is over there for Bernoulli trials, has this property. So what is really important is the fact that you're living with a process which is, has the conjugate property. As you update the posterior, you always stay in the same class of probability distribution. That will be true for any stable distributions, right? I mean, Levy, uh, Levy or any stable, alpha stable. Any conjugate, any conjugate distribution is gonna have this property. Then it's, it might be more or less complicated to solve this. In the Gaussian case, you reduce to a Kalman filter. In the Bernoulli over there, it, it, it's a little bit more intricate because the form is not Gaussian, but in general, yes, the property which is important is, I mean, you call it stable or conjugate, they call it conjugate, the, the two cases, but yes, the point is that as you update, you always stay in the same class of probability distribution to, to, make, to make it understandable without keywords, yes, that's the key point. Any other question? I understand it's not, you know, you're not going to go out now and solve the POMDPs, but I want to give you an idea of what all this stuff is. So then you can go and read, read yourself because it takes time, it takes time. It's a, it's a big literature. So I want to, I want to give you a little bit of the landscape so that you can go and read them uh, uh, yourself. So is that clear? Yes. Yes. A and B are the two possible arms that you can play or the two possible coins that you can play. 
The state in that case is, as I wrote before, is that those are the probability distributions. Those are the probability of rewards for the two arms. It's the case that we were discussing the second lecture, right? You pull an arm and it has a certain probability that you win or you lose. This is the expected probability of winning for arm A, and this is the expected probability of winning for arm B, right? No, this one, okay, no, this is, these are the probabilities. No, in fact, it doesn't change. What changes is your belief on what the state is. The state doesn't change. The state is here. So the fact that you play arm A or arm B doesn't change the, the arm. I mean, it doesn't get consumed by the fact that you pull it. The probability doesn't change, okay? So whether you play arm A or arm B, the states stay the same. The probabilities don't change, the real ones. What changes, it's your inference on the state of the environment. It's your belief. This is what changes and gets updated, okay? Search. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what you do in practice is that you, you train your glider. I mean, we haven't done this, we haven't got to that, but uh, at the end, you, you, what, you, what you end up with with the Q function uh, typically, you work with the Q function in practice, okay? So you, you train your glider, you learn a Q function. This training has been done uh, once. Then you have your, on your uh, uh, glider, you have a sensor for acceleration, you have a sensor for the velocity. So you have these mechanical inputs. They get uh, input into the processor. The processor has the lookup table, or in more complicated cases, it has to do a little bit of a calculation. It calculates, given the input uh, uh, stimuli, the percepts, it spits out what the probability of what you should be doing. And then there's a controller which tells the, the glider, bank, or do what you have to do in response to this. Yes. 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 Correct. So you have a training phase, which hopefully you, you shrink the S or the P you parameterize in such a way that it's doable with the limited number of observations. Okay. Sure. One, one of yeah, so in our case, it was, a, it was a, a nine by five, so it was 45. So we went, in general, it's a DNN, it's a deep neural net. Well, you know, if you take a deep neural net, go and train, of course, it's in order to get trained, it's gonna take millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years. So that's where the, key, the cooking and the art comes in. How can I shrink the, the, the state space? How can I shrink the belief space? How can I make it affordable in a limited uh, time? Because of course, as it was discussed before, then in practice, you have a few hundred uh, observations. In our case, we could not go out in the desert and spend like the next 10 years of our life training the, the system. Uh, in his case, he has a few, a few hundred or a few tens of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of observations for, uh, for these different cases and he has to apply. Uh, so that, that's where, and that's where the problem comes because then you're constrained by, by on the state space. So what is the analog of the F prime less than one condition in this for the probability distributions? It's the same as before, because the, uh, you remember the property that I've been using is not that much what V of star was here. V of star, I was picking just the soup over the space. So the fact that this is a continuum, it's discrete, it doesn't really matter. It still applies. But there'll be multiple derivatives. It's a multiple dimensional space now, right? 
the it's always multidimensional space because the state space is multidimensional. It, the difference is that here a priori it got continuous, unless you have this property of just a few parameters. Okay, so uh, okay, so what do you do with uh, in practice and why why it converges? Okay, so let me do the Q at the speed of light. So now, what happens if you don't know the model? So nobody is telling you what the model of the environment is because you remember. In this case, I'm still supposing that I know what the environment is and I don't know my state, I have to infer. But I know that it's a Bernoulli, for example. I know that my bandits are Bernoulli, I get zero one, depending on how I play. So I have a good model of the environment, this is known. But imagine in a second, that for a second that you don't know, like in the atmosphere, you don't know, you don't know turbulence uh, even those who know turbulence, they don't know exactly what, what the environment is going to do to, to be res in response to a certain observation. So, um, so what's the idea? The idea is that I would like to solve this equation. Okay. My dream is that I would like the holy grail would be to solve this. I solve this, I'm done. Now, I cannot do this. The only thing that I have in practice are observations. So I do this, I make moves. I'm in a certain state, which I suppose I know. Now I'm up in the left, so I suppose I know my state. I take some actions and I get some reward. There's some immediate reward. In response to this, I do S of P plus one, A of P plus one, and so on. This is the only thing that, that I know. Um, now, the other thing that I would like, so what I would like to solve is this. I would like to find the Q function that solves this, I call all this B. And as before, Bellman Q minus Q equals zero. So if I move this to the other side, then this becomes an equation equal to zero, which is a little bit more intuitive to understand. Minus Q star equals zero. And the reason I can move this is that this is normalized to one, therefore I can just move it to the other side. So this, it's called Bellman error. So what is Bellman error? Bellman error is this is what you would get if you had, uh, if you, this is what you really get. And this is, uh, this is the difference between the expected reward Okay, uh, so I can write this again in, into another form, which is RR, which is the actual reward. This is R, my R here. And then I have this uh, difference here, which is minus Q, which is here, minus lambda uh, max. So what is this? This is the actual reward, and this is the expected reward. In other words, what I'm getting here is the difference between what I really observe and what I would be expecting uh, if the system had got to, uh, to convergence. And the idea then, is that the way you solve this problem is that 
take this, you have a current estimate of, and what you do is that you update your, in by this, and this is the temporal difference, excuse me. This is the famous TD by which these equations are getting solved. So you start with a iterative, uh, with an estimate of the function Q. You calculate, you take an action, which initially is something which is more or less random, and you keep updating your Q function based on this error here, where alpha of T is a learning parameter. And you select uh, actions. So you select actions, probability of action. Is selected according to this the sum over this. So what you do is that you start with the next, uh, you start with the guess, you update them with the TD, uh, the TD error, with the Bellman error between what you get and what you should have got. If this difference is positive, then it means that the action is something that gives a lot of reward. Therefore, you update and you increase the Q function of that. If the TD difference is negative, it's a bad action, at least your estimate is there. So you reduce the quality of this state action and you bring it down and you keep doing this and you keep doing this according to this, uh, with, the, with this uh, picking states. Okay, so it converges, this one converges uh, in general because of the contractility. There's an extra convergence that you have to be careful with, which is the choice of the alpha T. And here comes uh, another bunch of results that uh, I'll have to go very fast on this, uh, which is the so-called stochastic approximation. So the iterative scheme on Q converges because of the contractility. Now you have to choose properly the alpha t's and here comes the stochastic approximation theorem. So it's the same problem as before. Let's pick the one details. You remember we had to solve this problem, this 1D problem of finding the fixed point. So if I define G as F minus X, my problem becomes the following one, that I have G of X, I have X, I have a fixed point X star, and this function, because you remember the derivative was less than one, this function is positive on this side and this negative on this side. So now what I do is that when I start from this point, this is gonna go negative, and then I'm gonna move more and more on, on, on this side. Now, the problem is that I don't know my function g of x. If I knew this function g of x, I could iterate. What I really know is the sampling of the function g of x. So I know g plus noise. Because I only have sampling of my function g, which are, the function is sampled from examples. And therefore, it's going to be g plus some noise, which is coming up on top. And uh, here comes a result by Robinson Morrow. Who wanted to solve exactly this problem. So the problem where I have a uh, contracting property like this one, but I cannot sample G, I can only sample G plus noise. And they wanted to define, they wanted to find the iterative scheme like this. G, such that this scheme converges to the fixed point. Okay. How do you pick the alpha n? Now, if you pick the alpha n, so this is the scheme of solution. 
And in general, it's not going to converge. If you pick the alpha n, you keep them fixed, for example, they're not going to converge. If the alpha n are too small, they decay too fast, it's not going to converge. What Robbins and Morrow show is that the convergence, you do converge with the following uh, conditions, that the sum of the alpha n should go to infinity, and the sum of the alpha n squared should go to a constant. These are the conditions. So for example, one over square root of n is good. One over n is marginally good. If you take a constant, then it doesn't work. If you make it decay too fast, one over n cube, it doesn't, it doesn't converge. The reason is very simple. The reason is that as you approach, right, what you're doing is that you're jumping like this, right, with this here, you're approaching if, the function is decaying too rapidly, then you stop at the point which is still far from this point here. So you don't forget the initial condition. If your function decays too slowly, then as you approach here, what is going to happen is that you're going to jump up and down, up and down. And therefore, because this is not sampled like this, but what you really sampled are points which are around here. When you get close here, Maybe this point is going to be positive because of the noise, and therefore it's going to push you to the other side. And so you start oscillating and you don't converge. So to answer your question, uh, you have to pick this alpha with the robbins moro condition, and then you're, you're, you're guaranteed. And with this, I'm done. So uh, let's thank Massimo for those wonderful set of lectures. And uh, yeah. Thanks. Any, any questions? Just what, what could be the possible uh, source of noise in the audit? The source of noise is not noise, it's the fact that you're sampling, uh, you're sampling from examples. I, you don't have your, uh, you don't have your, you only have observations. Observations are going to be, are going to give you results plus, plus the noise, which is intrinsic because you're, you're just sampling from a few examples. That's what the source of noise is. It's the sampling noise. It's the, it's the fact that you don't observe, think you observe just samples, finite, finite, finite uh, amount of samples of data. Forget about that. Let, let's live in an ideal world. The problem is that you don't know what the environment is going to do. So, but then in addition, you have the old sources of sort of noise which are coming from from the turbulence. Uh, it's it's more than enough. It's more than enough. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I, I'm just wondering that uh, for an optimal policy, is it possible for the uh, quality function and value function to be multi-valued? To be multi-valued. Uh, what do you mean by? I mean, I mean, uh, are there uh, more than one way to get the uh, first? So I I showed you before that uh, uh, you you have a single fixed point. Okay? So you have a single fixed point that you that you converge. This is the Banach uh, contractivity. Except, yeah. So the, 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 then you converge to that. In practice. Uh, with with this scheme, you can you cannot converge because in practice, if you cool, uh, for example, if you cool uh, too fast, if you cool too fast, you could get stuck. So then, in the, in the reality, you have to be careful with this choice with this cooling because all this is cooling. It's like in a it's like in a in a in a in a physical system. You know, there's a minimum, but you could because of the cooling, which is too fast, you could get stuck. And then you could get phenomena like the glasses and the other things because of the cooling, which is too fast. But remember the property, uh, that's why I spent some time. Remember the property of contractivity. Underlying all this, there's a very strong property, which in general you don't have, which is this contractivity. 
and the fixed point of mass. Yes. The property of the potential, the property of the potential, which is important. I mean, if you want to formulate in terms of a potential, then you should take this and turn into a potential, or this would be the force which is which is pushing you. The point of this force, which is special, is that it's negative on this side and it's positive on this side. So you should imagine putting a force which is pushing you this way if you're here and pushing you this way if you're here. But if you add some noise, then so in general because of this property what is going to happen is that you're going to converge to the minimum which is here now if you add noise on top of this then of course what can happen is that this which a priori without noise is negative is positive it's going to turn into negative and it's going to push you back from here so that's the difficulty of the of the The potential is what it is. That's where the problem of the convergence comes, comes in. So this potential, this slope here could be more or less strong. And in multi-dimension, there could be some dimension where you converge very fast. In some dimensions, it's almost flat. So if in some dimension, this curve is almost flat, of course, the convergence is going to be very slow. So this is where the difficulties come in, come, come in for the real convergence. You know that eventually you're going to converge, but it might take forever because, for example, the slope is, is almost flat. And there's many, many dimensions, and therefore you have to converge on all possible dimensions, and therefore it takes forever. These are the practical things that make that in some cases you cannot converge. But with this property, you should be able to converge. But how long? It's another issue. But you see the point, right? This function is not under your control, in a sense. This is what it is because of the process and because of choice. Now, what people do then is that they choose the reward function, the state space, and so on, and they cross their finger and they hope for the best that this function is such that you, uh, you converge. Of course, the smaller is the state space, the less dimension you have to converge, and therefore, in general, shrinking the, sh the state space helps convergence, which is obvious. I mean, that's, that you have less dimension. To converge. But how this slope changes as a function of the choice of R and the states, it's hard to predict. And therefore, that's where you do this cooking that you generally do. You do the what is called reward shaping. So you change the reward function hoping that the convergence is going to get sped up. That's where you have to, to do a little bit of cool. That's where the cooking comes in. Yes. Uh, 